this go? All right, yes. I mean, it's on my side now, right? So I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to get an army of guys. Four or five six people. Okay. I'm here all day, at least until after the pregnancy. My sons have three three sons are all in their thirties now, they're all in the military. And uh, and so my, my, my brother in law and my nephew are up too, so let's, let's go out and buy a ticket for all the games and you know, we'll shoot a few boxes in place. And so we did. And, and so all of a sudden my we're thrown into the wind and, and we have hand throwers and, and my uh, my nephew threw one up and it goes up and, and you know three guys with fire boom 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 all three of them miss because the thing is going straight into the wind. Have you ever thrown a frisbee into the wind and have it go like this? That's exactly what the clay vision did, all right? It went like that, and all of a sudden, you know what those frisbees? They come right back at you. And the thing's coming right at me. <laughs> and I see it They're aiming. I jump to the side, and then I can't figure out where the clay go. And then I realize it landed in the box of clays that were in my face. <laughs> 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 the three people missed it. It turned around in the 180 and came right back out. And it decided it wanted to stay in the box. <laughs> uh, true story. I offered my, I offered my nephew a thousand dollars if he could do it again in the next hour. And he could, uh, <laughs> take my money. So, all right. But he tried. Uh, many of you I got to meet uh, upstairs. So I'm Chaplain Matthew Frankie. I'm a Missouri Senate Chaplain, uh, stationed here at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. I wasn't always a chaplain. I started out as a, as a line officer. I was a comm computer officer and a space <laughs> systems analyst. So um, out in Colorado Springs, there's this Air Force base that's inside of a mountain, okay, called NORAD. <clears throat> so I, I worked with the unit, developed all this hardware and software support for NORAD for a few years. Uh, and then felt the, the tug and the call to, uh, to come out of the Air Force and go to ministry. So I went to St. Louis, uh, the Missouri Seminary there. Uh, partly because that's where I met my wife. Uh, I graduated from Washington University in my engineering degree uh, in St. Louis, and so that was kind of home for us. And, uh, and then came back in. Uh, I was a pastor in Minnesota for three years at the Rushmore, Minnesota. Here's another strange story. So Rushmore, St. John's Lutheran Church, Rushmore, Minnesota. And we're way down here in the southwest corner of Minnesota, close to the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There's also, in the Missouri Senate, a St. John's Lutheran Church at Rush Ford, Minnesota, is <laughs> over here. And guess what? They both have P.O. Box 128. <laughs> so we got the trip in LA. After three years, I was looking to actually get into the reserves, uh, similar to what Pastor Whitney is doing. I could not find a billet anywhere around, uh, and I didn't want to be driving too far for weekend reserve duty. I was looking to be a traditional reservist. And I uh, couldn't quite get that. And so I said, hey, I'm not finding a billet within 500 miles. And I said, would you consider coming back on active duty? Uh, we're really short on active duty chaplains. And uh, my wife knew what it was like being on active duty. I knew what it was like. Um, she thought she was marrying a, a, a military officer before she ever knew she was marrying a pastor. So, uh, so we said, yeah, we'll give it a try. So what I'd like to share with you today is uh, just some... Some of you may be acquainted, but you've got, you've got how many folks here have some military bags? Okay, that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I preach in South Texas sometimes. And, uh, Can we dismiss the Sunday school? I'm sorry, we certainly may. Wait, before the Sunday school goes, picnic afterwards. I have 60 hamburgers, first come, first serve. All right, there's also games. I, we have bowling, the twist, um, plunger. Lots of them, they're all clean, I promise. Uh, and uh, also the mandatory quick uh, uh, ball, which has been a tradition for multiple years. So come, uh, come to the picnic, we'll have them in the gym and outside, and a little bit of both, because there's also an optimal course, so that's yeah, going to be fun. All right. Thank you. Are you going to stay? All right, just one more. i got to ask, you were at Cheyenne Mountain? Is there, uh, is yes, there really yes. a door that says Stargate Command? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when that movie came out years ago, um, that technology in the movie is much better than what is it actually in the mountain. <laughs> so, uh, when I was in the mountain at the time, we actually... <laughs> what, what is in Shine Mountain, if you've 
there's a mix of it. Um, there's, so you have a, a base that's built underneath 1,400 feet of solid granite. Okay, it's on the south side of Colorado. Um, all the but but they, they took a, and they carved it. This is the mountain. They, they kind of took a tunnel that went like this. And that's hard. And it followed kind of a natural fault line in the rock. And they figured this is back in the days of Cold War. And they figured if a nuclear blast hit, they were going to try to take it out. The shock wave would roll down through the tunnel and kind of out the back side of the mountain. Okay? And I've been through both entrances. But then they built this kind of cross-hatched, tic-tac-toe type of uh, uh, tunnel system on the mountain, which is really, they use the same technology they used for making railroad tunnels, you know, through the, through the Rockies and stuff like that. And they pushed all that stuff out the front. And they made them big enough, however, that you have three-story buildings inside there. And the three-story buildings are on these huge springs that weigh about a ton each, okay? And they have shock absorbers like you've never seen in your life. Because the idea was that this mountain got hit with a nuclear detonation that the whole thing could rock and, and roll and, and survive with it all. So it's, uh, if you go inside, it's not quite that glamorous. It's kind of like being on a ship, if you've ever been on a Navy ship. There's kind of metal all around, and it's always some kind of white noise humming. And <laughs> thank God that you in there all the time. That was, that was how I support I was there now. Let's talk to you about the chaplaincy, though. All right? So the military chaplaincy, uh, in, the, uh, in the Missouri Senate, it actually falls. We have a, a military chaplaincy support actually falls under the board of missions, and uh, they made it, in Matthew Frankie's uh, estimation, they made it, it falls under the board of foreign missions, okay, and, and, and I would beg to argue this should be under domestic missions, okay, um, and, and the argument is always, well, you're all over the world, the military's all over the place, right, but we're not all over the world to go evangelize and to do everything to every place we go. Okay, we are there, and this sometimes is where chaplains get themselves in trouble, just when they try to do that, because you're sent there on behalf of the federal government to take care of the men and women who have been sent there with you, okay? So you're not really supposed to go out and do a lot of humanitarian stuff or evangelism and things like that. But, uh, <clears throat> but it does fall under the Board of Missions, and we'll talk some more about that. Uh, this is, uh, some of these pictures go back a few years. Uh, these was in Iraq, so this is me on the left. Uh, I was a major back then, and... Uh, uh, three striper airman here. He's getting ready to hop in that gun truck with a 50 caliber on top and drive it down to escort a convoy uh, across the roads in Iraq. And you can see a few years another up armor Humvee with another 50 caliber. Um, and then over here we've actually got a, a KBR fell on ground and root commercial trucking that we're contracted. But you notice it's got this nice cage on the front, so that somebody tries to throw a, a brick or a Molotov cocktail or something like that, you know, it helps affect the civilian truckers, these contractors that are driving. And it looks like it's part of an army convoy over here because we've got an army flatbed and all the different things there as well. Um, when I was in Iraq, I was in Balad, Iraq, which is about an hour north of Baghdad. Um, it's kind of right where the river makes a bend. <laughs> and it's a major, uh, it was a, the Lot Air Base was an Iraqi air base that, um, it's about 24 square miles, okay? So it's a pretty good sized piece of land. And we operated as a major hub out of there. Uh, the Air Force was <clears throat> flying in most all the supplies, and then these guys would get on the gun trucks and, and the convoys, and they would escort it out and take the different uh, operating bases and place around. So I kind of got a good connection. These were one of the units that I was tied to, uh, assigned to. And, uh, and so it was very common for me, whenever they rolled out on a convoy, be it day or night, uh, to meet up with them about an hour before they were supposed to leave the gate. And, and that was just to take some time to uh, talk with them, pray with them. Um, when they did a convoy prayer, they went, or excuse me, when they did a convoy brief, uh, they would have everybody, all the drivers, everybody would huddle in. Uh, we're in the, oftentimes it's in the middle of the night, it's 1.30 in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, they're out in some dusty uh, you know, yard where they're marshalling you know, these trucks. And, uh, and they say, okay, you know, here's, what we're, here's where we're going tonight, here's the destination, here's what we're hauling. Okay? So depending on what you're hauling depends on how you're going to react. Okay? If you get ambushed, if you're hauling fuel, you're going to stay in a straight line and stay far apart. <laughs> Okay, you don't circle the wagons when you're hauling fuel. If you're not hauling fuel, hey, we're going to bring them up, bring up the trucks side by side. We're going to minimize our exposure. You know, kind of circle the wagons in, in a modern day sense, and we're going to hit a defensive posture and, until we get help uh, or until we get moving. But, but again, if you're hauling fuel, you, you know, one fuel truck gets hit, it just blows everything else up too. So you know, here's what we're hauling. Here's where we're going. Here's what the frequency is for the medevac in case we need to get the you know get the medevac in here with the helicopters. Here's what the frequency is for the QRF. 
uh, that's a quick response force. So um, these guys are not there to go uh, conduct war, but the QRF are some really bad dudes you don't want to mess with. They're the ones that if you get attacked, they're going to come in and turn the fight. Okay, they're going to go on the attack and, and deck out the people that attacked you. Uh, you know, and so they would kind of go down through the whole list to make sure everybody was in sync with what was going on that day or that evening. And then the last thing they would say is, we have a chaplain here, chaplain, would you give us a prayer? Uh, anybody, you know, would like, doesn't want to participate, feel free to, you know, move back to the trucks or whatever. I never once saw a person walk away. And I did dozens and dozens and dozens of this. Uh, and so when I was about, to, about less than a week from heading back home, uh, this uh, young airman says, hey, chaplain, you know, can I get a picture of you? I want to have a picture with my chaplain. And, and so we did. Uh, a couple a couple uh, years later, I was uh, at the war in China, Wyoming, and you don't have a lot of wartime deaths from a nuclear missile base. Okay, kind of figure that out, right? You have a nuclear missile base, that's their main operation. You don't have a lot of people getting killed doing nuclear missile operations, all right? But we had a, we had a wartime fatality. And it was because it was one of our LRS, our logistics readiness squadrons, okay, which includes transportation. Uh, it was one of these young men who uh, was back on their second or third deployment doing what this guy is doing, and, uh, and they got killed uh, by an by a IED. Okay? And so um, it was kind of interesting because I remember the guy. And, uh, and then a bunch of his friends showed up who had been with him in the deployed setting. And they all came out and said, Chaplain Frankie, do you remember us? Okay? <laughs> because they all remembered me, because I was the chaplain that was with them. At that point. All right, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, again, I'm from the Missouri Synod. Just a few pictures here. These are from Iraq, too. I cannot read Arabic, but I do know that this word stop looks like two guys in a canoe, and the back person has two heads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how I remember it. It's the same on every country, every, every country I've gone to. So this is me sitting on top of a, it's called a HAZ, a hardened aircraft shelter. This is what I'm sitting on top of. So this thing is supposed to be uh, able to protect the, the Iraqi jets. Uh, the French built them. And uh, they were guaranteed, you know, for nothing can penetrate them. And I don't think the Iraqi <laughs> government ever got their rebate back because we penetrated them and crushed them pretty good. Uh, the last thing we wanted to be in the Iraqi military was an Iraqi fighter pilot because he's not going to last very long um, yeah. once he got above the ground. So, uh, so let's talk a little about what chaplains do. And I'm looking at the clock back here. We got to about 1025 or so. All right. So if I get too long, somebody. I actually edited the slide this morning before I uh, shut down the computer. Um, we really, if you look in the Air Force Chapel Corps, and it really expands to the, to the Army and the Navy uh, as well, that we, we really have two core competencies, okay? We have pastoral care, and there's a whole lot of stuff that falls under that, which we'll talk about, and then leadership advisement. So whether I work for a squadron commander, for the wing commander, right now I work for the four star general, General Bunch, right across the road over here at Air Force Material Command. Um, he turns to me, any of those leaders, he or she turn to me, but when it comes to anything that has to do with religion, spirituality, uh, morals, morality, ethics, okay? So that's kind of our job jar in doing that. So, so we do have, a, do have a role in that. But uh, really, we're chaplains, uh, we're pastors for us who are Lutheran, but really clergy persons, <laughs> that's kind of a broad term, for, for good reason, okay, so we have Catholic priests, we have Jewish rabbis, we have Muslim imams uh, who serve as, as military chaplains and officers, but we serve both as, a, as an officer and as a, as a clergy, all right, and, and I say persons because we have male and we do have female chaplains too, depending on what, uh, what organization or what religious body they come from, all right. Um, I said we're a lot like missionaries, we fall under the board for missions, and you think about it, I, I, I look at uh, Ron Mudge graduated from seminary with me, and Ron and Lisa got married, and they went off to Cote d'Ivoire, okay, to the Ivory Coast. Uh, Ron spoke pretty fluent French, Lisa really, you know, ganged up on it, um, and, and, but then I started getting the pictures back for Christmas cards and stuff like that, and it's like, that's not what they looked like when they left, right? So, <laughs> you know, they lived in the culture, they had yeah. to wait six months to get furniture in their house because they had to wait for the local carpenter to build it for them, all right? There was no DHS shipping where they were or anything like that. Wearing the same clothes? Oh, yeah, right? They were wearing the same clothes as, uh, as the people around them, okay? 
learned to speak the language. Well, that was kind of a prerequisite before they went, and they got better, I'm sure, as they were there. And sharing that life uh, with people around you to earn credibility. I've, I've read years ago that it takes really about seven years or so for a person to you know, gain this credibility that you can actually have the right to talk about the deeper things of life, not just the positive weather, how your crops do or whatever, but if you're talking about things of faith and the soul. And so our missionaries, you know, from LCMS and, and other mission organizations around the world, do this stuff. And you think about what do chaplains do, okay? Well, you saw what I was wearing in the previous, and I'll leave that back up here, right? I wear the same uniform, I, I put on boots, uh, I, this is, I don't wear this most of the time, right? Very rarely. Uh, I, I put on my boots, I wear the same uniform as everybody else there. Uh, I live the culture. I have to do the PT test every year along with everybody else. Right? <laughs> and uh, thankfully, I've, for years I've been a runner. Okay? I've done a few marathons, I've done many half marathons and, and, and 10Ks and 10 milers and stuff like that. So it's always kind of fun because chaplains tend to be the old guys. Uh, because we have a lot of extra schooling and experience and stuff like that before we come back in uh, to do that. So I was, always would have this. Uh, uh, every now and then, I kept getting these young Arabs saying, well, what did you score on your PT test? And I said, I scored a 98 or whatever. And they said, well, that's because you're old. You're <laughs> 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 and so I started, whenever I got my PT scores, I'd run them and see what they were if I was 18. Okay? You know? And then I could honestly say, yeah, but if I was your age, I would have got a 93. Right? So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> So we, we do live in the culture, right? And that really ties into earning the credibility and doing that. And, um, you know, when going's employed, uh, to be there where they are, yeah. wherever they are. Uh, learn to speak the language. Uh, <laughs> those of you that are military know that there's a different language to speak, right? And Acronym I catch now. myself all the time, you know. So I used to give the example, it's, it's kind of dated, but, you know, I used to say, you know, swing by the CBPO and go pick up a copy of your LES before you go to the left. And most of you, that's like, you know, you know, you know, it's like Charles Brown's teacher. Uh, but, but, you know, back in the day, what that meant was swing by the consolidated base personnel office and pick up a copy of the leave earnings statement, which is a page sheet, which shows what, you know, how your finances are laid out. Uh, before you go to our duty, which is what we call a business trip, okay, is the UI, think of a business trip for a military. So, but we do learn to speak the language, and the language differs, okay, I have a son of the Navy, anybody here Navy? Really? The little one. No one <laughs> he's a little I have a son of the Navy, he's a, he's an Annapolis uh, grad helicopter pilot, and they have a whole different language, right, you know, they're talking about decks and ladders, they're not floors and stairways, it's, you know, there's a whole other language for that. And, and if you're going to work among and get credibility with people that you work with and that you minister to, um, that really helps <laughs> so that you, you understand what you're doing. Any questions so far? Okay. All right. Somebody talked about why are the chaplains. Um, somebody approached me earlier today uh, upstairs and said, you know, do you know why the chaplains? I said, you mean the constitutional or the historic reasons? So the historic, it actually goes back to George Washington. Okay. And George Washington actually paid out his own pocket to have a chaplain to pay a clergy to go with him. And then he actually petitioned for Congress. So we got the records from okay, that, that's asking the Continental Congress to pay for chaplains to be with the men in the field. Okay. So that goes part of the history. Uh, Missouri Synod, I think our first Missouri Synod chaplains go back to the days of the Civil War. Okay. Yeah. Um, but constitutionally, it goes back to this First Amendment. Thing, okay, so the free, the right of every member of the United States military to practice their freedom of religion. So there's a lot of things in the First Amendment of the Constitution, but that's where we talk about the religious clauses, right? And it says, Congress shall establish no law regarding, first clause, the establishment of a religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Okay, and those are really always in tension. So in other words, we're saying. We're not going to say that Catholicism is the official religion of the United States. And they, that's kind of what they were wrestling with at yeah. the time. If you go in the context of what the founding fathers were doing, they're like, well, we all came from Europe, and every place in Europe had a state religion, right? So what's it going to be here? Because 
I mean, you got the Catholics over in Maryland, and they got these Episcopalians and Anglicans, you know, around Virginia, and who knows what that Woods guy is doing over in Rhode Island. That's some crazy stuff. <laughs> and you got the Quakers up in Pennsylvania. So what are we going to do? Yeah. And they really came up with a really, I, I think it's a brilliant thing. You know, you're not going to establish a religion. They, they laid it out for people. They said, we're not going to establish a religion by law, nor will we prohibit the free exercise of So when you hear the words free exercise of religion, that's where it comes from, okay? That's also where we talk about the anti-establishment clause, okay? And that comes in very much in play with, with chaplains. So we're there to make sure that they can practice their religion. Because sometimes we get sent to places where you can't just go to church on a Sunday, all right? Uh, my son on a Navy ship for months and months and months at a time. Um, he gets to go off the ship and flies his helicopter, but then he lands it right back on the ship again. Uh, and so, you know, he's refreshed when he sees a chaplain come, uh, come over to the ship and he gets to see one. Um, when our folks, uh, Army, they tend to go down to Fort Polk, Louisiana, or the National Training Center out of Fort Worth, California, and they're out there for most of the time, and plus the spin up before that to get ready to go. And, and so, you know, if you're out on a month long training mission in the desert, uh, yeah, it's good to have a chaplain out there when you're out there for a month more at a time. And of course, when you get sent off to war. So what do we do? Um, I kind of, we, we talk about this as kind of a, some Japanese here. We talk about worship, liturgies, and rites, and as Lutherans, we can kind of explain. Yeah, we can, we can talk that way, right? So there's some denominations that have more liturgies, you know, but, but uh, yeah, these are two chapters that I've served in. Uh, anybody recognize this one from there? Air Force Academy. Okay. Air Force Academy, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Yeah, they, uh, they sent me uh, my, my command chaplain, who's kind of the guy that was in my job right now years ago, sent me this cryptic email that says, congratulations on your new assignment. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was on Friday. And, uh, and I, was at, I was at Joint Base Lewis McCord in Tacoma, Washington, is where I was stationed. You been there? All right. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so I'm at Lewis McCord. I go home. I told my wife for lunch. I said, I said Looks like I got a new assignment. She goes, where? I said, I don't know. <laughs> she goes, where do you think? I said, well, I just came back from the schoolhouse, the Chapman Corps College down in Maxwell, and I know two of the lieutenant colonels are getting orders out of there. So I got that. Somebody said I ought to go there. They vectored me. That's one of the places they put in my vector. And, uh, <laughs> you know, places where you th we think you ought to go. I said, if I was a vet in there, I'd, I'd put this is at least $100. Maybe I don't know if I want to go to $1,000. I have my twenty hundred thousand dollar bet, so that's kind of how sure I am. I was solid hundred on this one. But I, you know, salvation in Christ that's a thousand, but everything else is a little risky. So um, finally, it's about two in the afternoon, and I, I just emailed him back. I said, "What the heck are you talking about? It's not nice, not, not nice to leave a guy hanging on a Friday afternoon." And he said, if "You haven't heard? Call me at this number." <laughs> So I called him up, and uh, he says, hey, Matt, I'm traveling, you know, I'm in an airport right now. He goes, I thought you would have known by now. I said, no, where am I going? I'm going to schoolhouse? He goes, no, you're going to the Air Force Academy. You're going to be doing chaplain, uh, head chaplain for the wow. cadets. So, so that, was, uh, that was one of my assignments, and I was there for two years. And uh, you can see here, the, the pews are filled back to about right here. And, I, yeah, I took that picture. Uh, it's Chad Thomas Webb up in the front there preaching that day. Uh, it's in the evening. Usually the sun's coming in really heavy on this side, but this is in the evening because this is during summer training. And when you're in a training environment, you can't be interacting with everybody else that's not in a training environment, right? So people think, oh, at the Air Force Academy, all the cadets are gone, is what they assume, right, for summer vacation or summer break, which that's not true. They get to leave about two weeks out of that time. And, uh, but actually it's much, much, it's probably about two and a half times the work during the summer as we have during the rest of the year. Because we have to do things like that. Not only did we have a Protestant service on Sunday morning that the public and everyone else can attend, but we have to have a separate one when all the gates are closed and nobody can come up and Aunt Jenny can't come up and check on Johnny, you know, her sister's a boy, and just, you know, see how he's doing and that kind of stuff. So, so that was one. This one over here was, uh, was back in Iraq. And, uh, and you can see this is just a kind of a standard Standard shelter that we have, you know, in the in the AOR, the area of responsibility, which is the, the AOR is what how we call it, the combat zone, uh, typically. <clears throat> but you see that there's pallets around here for some nice sidewalks, and uh, and we've got a steeple that was just built before I got there. 
Um, so we kind of somebody said we need to have something to kind of make us a little bit special. And I wondered over the years you can get anything you want if you just challenge the civil engineering folks. So oh they, yeah. <laughs> the CEs, they can do plumbing, dirt, you know, they can level the surface, they can put in the concrete, they can they can do everything our, our civil engineers wires. So all you gotta do is say, you know, there's no way in the world we're gonna get a church sequel out here or just these kind of put in those terms and pretty soon. Chaplain, I think we got some scraps. <laughs> and, uh, and so they built it, and here there's no bell. And uh, somebody says, uh, I think we had an army uh, officer that was there. He says, I think I can get a hold of it. He's going to buy a ground that uh, it's not linked up. You know, they're not going to reuse it. So, so yeah, we got one five five pallets around up there. <laughs> but, uh, but you see the, 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 the bags are up to here, and that's because if you're sitting down, um, you know, we, we had a lot of mortar and rocket attacks while I was there, um, well over 100 uh, while I was there. And you know, if something comes down and, and lands in the middle of that tent, you know, thank you Jesus for going there. Uh, but if it lands out here, for instance, then not only is that thing going to blow up and get shrapnel, but this is all sand, and it's going to be like the biggest shotgun blast you've ever seen, because every bit of that sand becomes a projectile, okay, and it just, it, it's a mess. And so if you're inside, if uh, the alarm goes off, if we're under attack, you know, no one stands up, you stay below that, and, and any kind of fragment, you know, it, you should be safe with the, with the sandbags. So, yeah, just another kind of church. <laughs> so, advising commanders and leadership. Um, each chaplain, uh, in, the, mil in the, the different branches of service do it a little differently. For the... Uh, for the Army and the Navy, hey, if every battalion's got a battalion chaplain, every brigade's got a brigade chaplain, you know, and, and kind of work it the way, you know, the Corps has a Corps chaplain and all that. And in the Navy, a similar structure. Uh, in the Air Force, what happens is we're tied to the base, okay, so I'm, I'm working for the wing chaplain, doing all the base ministries, I'm the on-call for the whole base, you know, when it's my turn and, and all that kind of stuff, but uh, but I have certain units that, I'm, that are assigned to me, and usually because the way it works out, I may have units that are kind of disparate, okay? They're not always in the, in the same group. And so this was back at, uh, this is back at Enemy Warren Air Force Base. So I had a 90 operations group, which included the office support squadron, the helicopter squadron. Uh, they just did overwatch, predominantly, when we were hauling nuclear weapons up and down the highway to make sure they were safe. And they, they had some, uh, some trained people to make sure that it was. And then we had three nuclear missile squadrons. Uh, this was the most powerful unit on the planet. While I was there, uh, 400 missile squadron had peacekeeper missiles on it, and each missile could have 10 independently targeted warheads. Okay, so picture that: uh, 50 missiles with 10 warheads each had a capacity for 500 nuclear warheads, uh, being commanded by one lieutenant colonel. Uh, for that wow. Time. Okay. Um, with the uh, missiles, typically what we have is the, the, the treaties that we have regulate how many warheads we have. They don't vote so much by how many launchers you have. How many <laughs> payloads or warheads you have. So, so what they typically did is they kept three warheads instead of ten, and they made sure they had, you know, uh, the missiles. But I also had the contracting squadron, I also had the services squadron, and, and oftentimes what happens is you know, those commanders like to be out there. Uh, it's how amazed that our military commanders, how they process information and, and take care of things and get the missions done. But I'll tell you, when something goes wrong in the unit, when somebody has a bad accident, a rollover, when somebody commits suicide, um, you know, as a captain, as, a, as an 03 captain, you know, how many times I would walk into a, into a unit and, uh, and, you know, the 05 or 06 commander, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, the colonel's up there, and, and they turn and they say, oh, thank God, the chaplain's here. <laughs> <laughs> because they know how to put, you know, codes and launch codes and missiles and do all the exercises, make sure we can launch them if we have to, make sure we don't launch them when we don't want to, all that kind of stuff. You have to exercise both ways. It's kind of the main thing. Uh, but, but when it comes to dealing with personal and crises and stuff, I mean, they, they got skills, but they are more than happy just to say, chaplain, you know, what do you got for us? And help us out. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, usually how that plays out is it's very different. When I was a pastor in Rushmore, Minnesota, way down in that corner, uh, <laughs> you know, there was a camel soup plant, and there was a swift meat packing plant, which were about, you know, a couple thousand hogs a day. Um, you know, and maybe one or two other big industries in town in Worthington next door, about 10 miles away. 
And I don't think they would be very keen on me going around in their businesses and walking around just talking to people. And I said, what are you doing here? Get out of here. You're not going to. Somebody's going to hurt themselves on the assembly line or, or whatever. Somebody's not going to be doing their job. It's different in the military. Those commanders, they can't get enough of you. And they want you out there. They want to see you. They want your people. They want their people to know who you are. Okay? And oftentimes, uh, I've been on the end of the call of, hey, chaplain, I haven't seen you here for a while. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, I had five counselings yesterday. Uh, whatever it might be. Uh, so, no kidding. I had a, the ops group commander at, at the missile base. Okay? So this is a colonel. Uh, we're, we're in Eagles. Uh, he gets his deputy to call me and says, Chaplain, I know you're busy. Is there any way you can get out here on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning? And I said, sometimes I'm preaching. I'm doing a liturgical service or, you know, a Protestant service. He goes, I understand that. Uh, he says, and, and here was his take. He's exactly right. He says, but <clears throat> those folks have the opportunity to go to any church around here. Okay? The people are getting ready to hop in the, in, the, in the pickup trucks and drive out to the missile alert facilities to go down to the silos for the next 24 hours straight. They can't, they can't go to church today. Right? So whenever you can, well, I understand if you can, but whenever you can, if you can come and just be here, that make a world of difference. And he was exactly right. But where else do you get folks that say that? Right? <laughs> the military did. And that's exactly going back to why we had chaplains. Right? Because those folks did not go to church on Sunday morning like everybody else says. Maybe come to the chapel, could have gone to the Lutheran church, or the Baptist church, or wherever on face. Uh, so uh, one time, uh, you, so you get to know these people. Um, and as a matter of fact, one time uh, I was, had been in the chapel for about six months, and I was driving with my wife uh, onto the base, into the base housing, and it was kind of a circuitous route, and we saw another chaplain, a, a female chaplain, Amy Daniels, who was on our staff. And so I kind of pulled over to the curb. She's walking the dog. Martha rolls down the window. She goes, hey, man, how are you doing? How are you doing, Martha? And she asked a rather pointed question. She says, so how are you doing with this chaplain thing? I mean, how's it fitting for you? I said, I, I like it. And, and, and then she, I'll never forget, she says right in front of my wife, you know what your problem is? I'm <laughs> <laughs> not in front of my wife. Amy, come on. You know, she knows all of them. You don't need to give her one more. Uh, <laughs> She says, uh, she goes, I think you're struggling with the fact that you know the people in your units better than you know the people in the pew on Sunday morning. And a light went on. Maybe she was right. She was. I've had 250 people in the pews on Sunday mornings, and I knew about 20 of them. Okay? Uh, and and it, was, it was different. There's no red book in the church office that said who's a member of the congregation. Um, Chapels are not churches. And yeah. sometimes, if anything, we have problems with chapels that become churches. And what I mean by that is chapels are built historically. I mean, talk about wayside chapels, right? Chapels are meant for people who are not permanent. People can come and go, right? And so you can come and go, and there's a chapel at every base, right? Um, but we're not meant to be churches and congregations, if you will. And sometimes when that happens in, in the Air Force, we get a little, a little bit of trouble because because then all of a sudden the person that's going to, now they're the outsider, right? Uh, because they don't know how things are done here or, or whatever it is. So, so you get out there, you, you meet these people, you get to know them. Uh, and one, one Saturday morning, my wife and I are doing some errands down Land Boulevard on the north side of Las Vegas to, you know, we stop at PetSmart to pick up some Imes dollar food for our black lab. And, and, uh, and there's, you know, people in there that say, hey, Chaplain. My wife's like, who's that? Airman in the recon squad. Hey, Chaplain! Oh, it's, it's Airman with Tucker squad. Right? And, and in the course of the, the morning, we had four different people approach me uh, with that. One time, we were out. Um, well, I'll say that for another slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this slide. Okay, pastoral care and counseling, right? So, going back, this is kind of what I was talking about. Unit visitation, our flock mm -hmm. isn't just those who come to the chapel, but they're really everybody on the base. Yeah. And that wasn't that way in Rushmore, Minnesota, right? There were people that went to the Presbyterian Church, and people that went to the Methodist Church, and people that went to the Lutheran Church, and there were people unaffiliated. But, but on the base, I'm responsible to, in some degree for everybody. Okay? And a big part of that is privileged communication. So what is said to a chaplain is actually part of the United States law, uh, U.S. Uh, code, that communication between 
an individual and a clergy person or a clergy assistant is considered privileged communication and will not be disclosed. So much so that, yes, we cannot tell anybody. And if you want me to share what you told me, I'm going to have you write down exactly what you want me to share, and I'm going to have it witnessed by an uninterested, disinterested third party so that I don't get in trouble. <laughs> because we've had chaplains that have broken this, not many, but every now and then, you know, in a few years somebody does, and, and they, the cross comes off and they're no longer a chaplain. Okay, it's that serious. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting because many of us as clergy took that vow in our ordination, okay? A Lutheran pastor thinks that the next time you hear an ordination, listen to it. You don't hear it. A Catholic priest will have that same ordination, right? They take it to the grave. And other denominations will, but not everybody does. So you may have a non-denominational or an E3 or whatever uh, that uh, that is a chaplain and says, well, I never took that vow. Now, whether you did or not, this is what holds, okay? It's, it's U.S. law, and there's nothing that we have to disclose. When I was a pastor in Minnesota, state law said that if anyone came and came to counseling or anyone revealed to me that they were involved in uh, child abuse of any form, I was mandated by law to report that, okay? State law. Well-intentioned, okay? I mean, you can see that. We don't want, if somebody knows about child abuse, we want to stop it. But there's a reason why we don't. Um, I asked him sometime, I said, hey, let's talk about confidentiality. It's a big word, what's that mean? And, and the airman in the back, it was a rescue squadron uh, air guy. He says, it means you can't wrap me up. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Confidentiality, yeah. privilege communication, you broke it down into single syllable words. You can't wrap me out. <laughs> And that's true. And so you come and tell me something that you're thinking about doing, something that you've done, whatever, I can't say anything by law. However, I can be very persuasive. I can try to use all my powers and a lot of prayer and Holy Spirit to try to convince you otherwise. You can tell me that you're going to commit suicide, it doesn't matter. Okay? Some people think that's usually the one thing. They say, oh, well, I told you they're going to commit suicide. Yeah, but I said, no. Uh, actually, sadly, I can't. And I had a I had, a I had a commander one time that uh, I walked in, and he was a new commander. And he said, hey, this one has some time. He kind of gets to know you, you know, get to let you know your chaplain. And he says, yeah. He goes, I fired a chaplain one time. And he's proud of it. <laughs> I said, no, tell me more. <laughs> he says, yeah. turns out uh, I was a squadron commander, and I had this, uh, this Air Force chaplain. And I had a suicide attempt in my squadron, and nobody saw it coming. Nobody knew anything about it, except we found out later that she had been talking to a chaplain. Yeah. And the chaplain never said a word. So I can understand how you'd be very upset about that. He goes, yep, I didn't want to hear from my chaplain anymore. All right, so I'm carrying on the conversation. As I walked out, I stopped to the secretary's or administrative assistant. I said, I need 15 minutes with the colonel sometime next week. You know, does that work? Great, I'll take it. Went back. I was a captain then, he was a colonel. Went back to my wing chaplain and says, uh, hey, here's what happened, here's what I'm going to do. I just want you to know, and you can call me off the ledge or whatever, but it's not going to go ahead. So I went back and uh, came in like, you know, 7.30 that morning. He says, hey, chaplain, well, come on in. You want to come out uh, You called this meeting. What, what do we need to talk about? And I said, I just want to give you the opportunity to fire me. Uh, <laughs> so I reiterated the story that he told me. I said, just, just hear me out. I said, uh, I cannot count on fingers and toes my first three years in the military and other people told me that they were thinking about committing suicide. And out of those, there's only one who attempted. And I was there in the ER when they were pumping her pumped stomach full of charcoal, and I was there when she came to. I said, but here's the deal. I said, I don't sleep well at night and I don't think they're safe. I do everything within my power. To make sure they're safe. I said, sometimes it's, yeah, I thought about it, but I got too much to live for. I couldn't do it for this reason, or I couldn't do it for that reason. I don't want to hurt my family, whatever it might be. Or it might be the other extreme of, yeah, it's like, okay, let's go to the hospital together. You know, security forces come to escort us. We'll go over there, and we'll sit there until a mental health professional. And I've sat in the, in the mental health uh, section for hours waiting for a mental health professional to come and do a warm hand. So I told the commander this, and I said, well, here's the deal. If the word gets out that the chaplain 
will tell the commander or the first sergeant what you told them. I said, no one's going to talk to you. No one is going to talk to you. She can fire me if you want. She can talk about it for seconds. Nope, you're much out. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, kind of rule people, you know, the kind of rule about being a terror, and you get ruled a lot by intimidation. As a matter of fact, when they left, he left, uh, they had patches made, and you know, I survived. But honestly, he, he, but he, did, he did well with not, if, if you weren't intimidated by him, you know, he respected that. And as a matter of fact, I crossed paths with him in airports and buses in D.C. and all kinds of places. And every time I did, hey, chaplain, he comes sit next to me on the bus. And he, uh, that he was a three-star <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's an important thing, um, it, you know. So you can get sent to mental health, and mental health folks have great skills and abilities. Uh, they have access to stuff and understanding how our, our brains and things work, and chemical imbalances and all kinds of stuff. But I don't even pretend to go near that. But people know that if they come to the chaplain, it's not going to be a record. It's not going to be out there anywhere. Um, the, the commander oftentimes can say, "You got to go get somebody for help. You need to go talk to the chaplain. Go talk to mental health. You need to go to somebody." And if that's the case, sometimes they say, I don't want to get my help, I can talk to the chaplain. And in that case, if they come and say, hey, did they come talk to you? I'll verify, yes, you know, I did see Aaron Snuffy. And uh, can you tell me what he talked about? I can't. One day he be there. He was scared, you know, he was all the things. All right. Uh, friendship, you know, military takes the car from home, and sometimes, you know, you just need somebody to talk to and who cares. And if you tell somebody in the dorm, it may just get all through the dorm, and that's the next thing you know, you're talking about in the facility the next morning, somebody will place a table and just talk about you, kind of thing. So sometimes they're just, just a sounding board. Uh, and, and people when do counseling, a lot of times just hearing themselves talk and, and working it out. It's, and, and sometimes asking the right questions, never telling what to do, but kind of helping them make the right decision, uh, gets around that way. When I was, I, I've said it many times, I did more counseling in the first three weeks as a chaplain than I did for my three years as a parish pastor in Minnesota. Yep. And that was, that was God's truth. So I, I typically, at, at Las Vegas, at Nellis Air Force Base, would average 90 plus counselings a quarter. Okay? So in a 13 week period, some days I'd have five, six counselings a day. I just have to kind of come up for air, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and leave the office for a bit. I come home at night and uh, put my arms around my wife while she's at the sink or at the stove, and she'd say, "Rough day counseling." Like, oh yeah, you know we got a good life. You know you hear other people's uh, stuff going on. Is so, there, do you get special training for that? Then? For, for the counseling, counseling part? For the counseling part? Uh, yeah. So that's a good question. So chaplains, unlike other military officers, chaplains kind of come credential. Okay, so it's you can. We can have doctors on scholarships, and then we bring them into the military, we train them, and we bring them in. So for all the military chaplains, you come from a church body, whether it's you know the Catholic priest or the prophet, pastor, whatever, and no one trains you how to be a pastor. Okay, we, we have that going in. So it'd be kind of like hiring a doctor or an oncologist or whoever off the street. You know, they're they're fully trained up. And the question is, you know, how do you operate and do that in a military setting? And that's where the training comes in. And so. I had some counseling courses uh, in seminary, uh, but I also we, we also have some that we provide through our Chapel Four Schoolhouse to, to kind of help out in some of those ways. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, not extensive, and it really is kind of a mixed bag, to be honest with you, when it comes to, to counseling. Uh, I had I had a young lady come in my office one time, and I knew I she wasn't one of, in one of my units; she was in another chaplain's units, and she comes in and and. Uh, and she was wrestling with an issue. And I knew she had seen this other chaplain across the hall. I had seen her in the, in the building. And I said, so have you talked to another chaplain? Oh, yeah, I talked to chaplain so-and-so. You know, what did he have to say? What was his perspective? He just kept wanting me to say amen. <laughs> and I could just picture the scene. <laughs> just picture it. Uh, you know, and this guy's an evangelical, you know, Protestant chaplain, you know, trying to... In his way of trying to steer her around to making a, what he thought was the right decision, and, and probably it was, uh, you know, was to just kind of lay it out and say, amen, amen, you know, and it's like she didn't understand that. That was her background. So so I, I wish we probably had some better resources, but we do some training in, in, that, in the schoolhouse as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay, so what does it take to be a chaplain? 
Um, this is a big thing that I struggled with when I, I was in the parish, and I loved being in the parish. Uh, I loved doing shut-in ministries and, and, uh, and the, you know, word and sacrament ministry. But when they asked me, hey, what do you think about coming back on active duty, I was struggling with that because I didn't want to leave my congregation. The congregation was actually, you know, we're talking about going to two services, a little country church, uh, 400 people in the town, and we were averaging 100 people on Sunday, so most of them were from out of town. Um, but I, I kind of got to thinking, and, and actually, I actually had a, one of our members that asked me, why do you want to leave us? Yeah. And that really uh, stuck me hard. <laughs> and I, I was doing my, my daily Bible reading one morning, and I think it was in Romans 10, maybe in, excuse me, Romans 12, or in the first Corinthians 12. They both talk about spiritual gifts. But uh, I'm reading along, and it talks about how the Holy Spirit uh, gives to each individual gifts as he apportions them, referring to the Holy Spirit. And I thought to myself, I have a call to St. Thomas Lutheran Church in Rushmore, Minnesota, but what gifts do I have to have here? And then I kind of came to me and do a pie chart, all right? So I'll tell how that works. <laughs> so get the pie chart, and here's a pie chart of uh, this pie is every pastor in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. Okay, and which of these pastors could serve the St. John's Lutheran Church in Rushmore, Minnesota? And I would probably say 95% of them could. Yeah, there's maybe a few that it's like, I do not want to smell a pig, <laughs> or I need to be somewhere really close to, 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 to urgent medical care. Okay, so let's, let's say 90, 95% could. But what, which ones could be a military chaplain? All right? And so first requirement, age. Take off half a pot, all right? <laughs> That's probably being generous. So about half the pie comes off. You know, for years, you have to be, uh, I think when I got in, the mandatory mandatory uh, age coming in, you had to be under age 32. And that's because mandatory retirement was age 62. Uh, it, it fluxes back and forth, so it's, it's moved around. But for most of the time, it's somewhere in that range. So you think all pastors in our, our church body, faithful ministers of the Word and Sacrament, but because of their age, they're not going to make it. Uh, into the military. Next requirement, you have to pass the next physical, okay, the same thing as the 18 year old that wants to go to the Marines, right? So you got to be able to get signed off and say, yeah, you're physically equipped to go do that. I have seminary classmates of mine that thought about getting into a chaplaincy, but they had back surgery, they had eye issues, they had one thing or another that disqualified them. Uh, and now, by the way, you got to do a PT test too. Uh, you want to be in the military, right? So let's face it, out of this is a different crowd here, but this is not the normal crowd. You're right outside the Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and, and but you go talk in the other parts of the country, other churches I've been in, it's like nobody there. You know, somebody got drafted in Korea or something like that, and, and, and God bless them. But but for the most part, less than two percent of the population in the United States has been in the military law. Okay, guard, reserve, active duty. So it's a very small contributions uh, required. Okay, it's a very small group. Most people say, like, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, by the way, if you're a married pastor, is your spouse willing to be a military spouse? That's a huge deal. I have literally spent years away from my wife and my family because of deployments and other tasks. And she has to do it all. She had a baby when I was under attack in Iraq. Okay? Yep. My daughter was born. <coughs> When I was under attack, I couldn't even call her until the all clear sounded because I didn't want to have my wife on the phone, have a physical delivery baby, and hear it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, what's that? You know, well, we nothing. It's nothing. That's another whole story. It's, it's tough being a military spouse. It really can be. And so um, my wife, I would argue, is tough. It's faster than I can maybe tougher. But uh, for different reasons. But, you know, that's, that's another piece of pie. And so we kind of get down to, I think that drinks down about one slice, if that much. And then you got to say, the last one I put on here, and there's more, but are you able to work in a pluralistic setting? And what I mean by that, I showed you the picture of the Air Force Academy Chapel there. I was the chapel for all the cadet wing, and uh, for a few, 4,000 cadets, and, and a bunch of cadre and folks. But my boss was actually a, an 06 Roman a Colonel, uh, Roman Catholic chaplain. And of all things, the two majors that happened to be sent to the academy to serve as my two branch chiefs, one was a female Jewish rabbi, <laughs> yeah. uh, reformed, uh, 
Okay. Yeah. And the other one was a Muslim imam. Okay. okay. Uh, who's to this day one of my best friends, and, uh, and, and we have a great relationship. I just had a great, great meeting with him recently about how we handle all these folks coming out of Afghanistan. Yeah. Because I guess they're mostly all Muslim, but they are many different types of Muslim as far apart as Lutheran and LDS. Okay? <coughs> right? So everything and how they practice and how you, how you handle and treat that, I'm glad he's on our side for us to <laughs> not do things we shouldn't do. Uh, but can you work in that setting? You know, yeah. can you work alongside the Catholic priest, the, the Baptist, you know, decisional theology or whatever it is? And I, I've got some great seminary classmates. I, I love them. Uh, they're great apologetics people, right? Defenders of the faith. But honestly, I can picture that they would spend more time trying to argue about real presence in Holy Communion with the Baptists than taking care of this airman out here that needs to get some counseling. Okay. Yeah. And you got to, we, we don't want you to be homogenous. We want you to be who you are and be true to your faith and your practice, but you got to be able to work in that environment, okay? So when I pull it all down, I'm down to what I refer to as a really small wedge of cheesecake, okay? Uh, and and that's, that's the person that has those gifts that can do what, what I'm called to do. And that gave me a great piece when people say, why do you want to leave us? Okay, or why do you feel you have to go do this? Um, I share that with a lot of new chaplains, and it's like, they're writing it down. It's like, okay, yeah, my wife's not, you know, we need to figure this out. <laughs> I didn't do that. And literally, a few months ago, I was at Hagen Air Force Base sitting down with a brand new chaplain. And I said, how are you doing with this? I love it. I said, how about your spouse? She's struggling. You know, and I said, maybe this can help her to see why God's called me to this place. And I say that very humbly because going back to it, I don't have those gifts, right? I don't get to pick my gift around shoulders or, you know, anything like that, which I don't. <laughs> so I don't get to pick all my gifts. Uh, they're given to me. And so I very humbly say that God has given me these gifts. I don't have all the gifts. Uh, I have a seminary classmate who does death and blind ministry. Well, guess what? Uh, it's, you know, excuse me, not it was a. Uh, not getting blind, deaf and, and dumb ministry, mute ministry. His, his mother was deaf, right? It was his first language. Before he started speaking English, he started speaking, you know, American Sign Language. Uh, he's got the gift, okay? Uh, and other folks have different gifts. I don't think I have a gift for inner city. I have to be rural all day long, okay? <laughs> but with all that, you know, that's what it takes. To have, for the Missouri Synod, we don't take somebody straight out of the seminary and throw them in there. There's some pastoral formation, is what we like to call it. You know, get your... Get your feet on the ground, figure out what it is to be a pastor, what it is to be a uh, shepherd of souls, and doing that and the responsibility and, and kind of get into that rhythm before you step into the military and do that. And then you have to have an endorsement of a religious organization. So for us, it's the Lutheran Church and Missouri Synod Ministry and Armed Forces. Um, we're getting close to the end of time here, so I'm going to need to move on. But, uh, you know, some kind of curses and blessings. You, again, you're multi denominational, multi faith. The people that you're preaching to are not all Lutheran. As a matter of fact, probably none of them. You yeah. uh, you know, your boss could be any denomination that's out there. And I say there's always tension, and I think there should be tension, because if there's not, you need to kind of check yourself and say, okay, have my beliefs and my practices changed? Or is life just really good right now? Nobody's asking me to do something that I know I shouldn't be doing. And, and so it's kind of good to do that. You know, the blessings that workplace ministry I talked about, you've got opportunity to proclaim good doctrine every time you step in. Um, in the pulpit, you know, but you don't, you don't know who's there that's going to be here this week and then gone next week or here to be quiet, right, on a business trip. Uh, you don't know the person that preached before you or the person that preaches after you. So every time you step into the pulpit, you just cherish that opportunity to proclaim the gospel uh, as we know and cherish it. Um, it's kind of nice to do have multiple staff. I don't have to be at every single meeting of the church, and I don't have to, <laughs> and we can kind of divide that out amongst our staff. And, uh, you know, the ministry resources I've gotten training in the military and chaplaincy, and Pastor Lou's going to get training uh, in things that you need to get to seminary and, and things that you pay the big bucks to go get trained in. Crisis ministry, critical incident stress, uh, a lot of that type of stuff um, picked up. Uh, and the benefits are, are, are nice as well. I don't have to worry about the church council and the voters assembly deciding what my health care package and my salary is going to be for next week. It's the same as any other firm but you've got to worry about Congress deciding. That's right. That might be a bigger yeah, concern. Uh, they have a nice history, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, a little bit less and more. Um, just because of who we're ministering, we're actually, the, the, the Air Force uh, and military are, are manned for active duty, right? So a lot of, we may have a lot of retirees 
that come to the chapel and do those things, we're made to take care of, of our active duty uh, men and women in uniform. So because of that, you don't have as much elderly and shoving here, uh, which is something I miss because I, I love doing that. Uh, less preaching, you know, you know, preaching every Sunday for the most time, for most places, and, and again, not in every pastor ministry. But boy, more counselings, uh, weddings, you know, uh, a lot of times they don't have an affiliation. They don't, uh, they're not a home church to go home to. I require six sessions, usually an hour and a half each, okay, so that's probably about ten hours of premarital counseling. I have killed off a lot of weddings that way. When you know they don't show up and you say, Hey, didn't we have a counseling session you know, this afternoon? It's like, oh, I'm sorry, Chad, I forgot to call and tell you that we, you know, we broke it off. <laughs> I've married a lot of folks too, okay? I still get, I still get calls and emails from folks uh, who are retired now. They said, Hey chaplain. I just let you know, we, you know, we had our fourth kid, you know, the oldest is off of college, and, uh, you know, we're still going strong. We still think about what you told us when we did premarital counseling, and, and, and so there's the other half of it, too, right? Some people think they should be married, and they really shouldn't, and they have the father. But we both like strawberry ice cream. We like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, you know, I got more bosses, um, uh, not only church, but the military inspections, training, um, Pastor Witt is going to get to find out what it is to do gas masks and Tim's <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I get 30 days to paid leave as active duty as, as many of you may have done in the past. All right. uh, there's always hot issues going on. Uh, right now, probably the biggest one right here is uh, religious accommodation issues, especially relating to the COVID vaccine. Okay? I know that's kind of a your name to throw out there, but that's my life uh, pretty much for the next few months at least. And, and it's kind of a wonderful thing because the, the military, uh, Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, often referred to as RIFRA, uh, years ago, about 12 years ago. And for a long time, the military says, well, we don't have to abide by that. And we're the military. And the Congress says, oh, yeah, you do. You're part of the federal government. And so there's kind of some pushback along the way, some figuring it out along the way. But basically what it says is that, you know, you shouldn't be required as a federal employee to do things that are against your faith. Okay? We're not going to make uh, the medic over here at the hospital perform abortions if they don't want to, if that's against their conscience and, and their specifically their religious faith, right? We're not going to say, hey, sorry, you know, you got to eat pork and you're easy with the art kosher, you know, you are Jewish or Muslim. We're not going to do that. And so we're going to try to accommodate people's faith as much as possible. The issue becomes where does faith and conscience cross? Okay? And there are two different standards there in terms of how that's dealt with. Uh, so that's kind of the big thing that's going on these days. But uh, yeah, I've, I've gone through the last until transgender. I sat on an Air Force level board that uh, worked the policy on that. And uh, I was able to put into their into the Air Force policy uh, in our working group that, that medical providers should not be required to perform you know, things that are against their conscience and religious faith uh, for people requesting transgender and doing those things, similar to what we have for abortion. But uh, yeah, always some, some hot topics that are flying around. Um, so if you know anybody that's interested in coming to chat, or maybe you know a young pastor out there, you know, if they're if maybe somewhere in the middle of this or, or beyond, uh, you know, keeping fit, you know, want to check it out, uh, let us know. Uh, send them our way. And it's a great opportunity. Yes? What about the civilians that are deployed with you? Uh, they're, not, they're not in second place there, are they? Or, I mean, uh, they, got, they can come have access to it or, or not. Yeah, so oftentimes our, when we're deployed, but in even home station, you know, when it comes to, to worship and stuff like that, always there. Um, when it comes to counseling and things, typically in crisis and stuff like that, yeah. I mean, in contract or two, I was, I was in a deployed setting in Qatar uh, back in 2012, I guess it was, and had a civilian contractor came in, and he had just found out, I forgot the word that his ex-wife and her two kids were with, uh, you know, out off the, off the coast at one of the islands down off Florida and got struck by lightning. And the, the, the son uh, had gotten struck by lightning and the mother had uh, a uh, new man in her life and, you know, her husband missed the scene. You know, we kind of helped, helped counsel him, helped expedite him back, you know. Sadly, I, you know, I couldn't take much to Google it and figure out a few hours later that, you know, that was the principal of uh, Herald the Report or whatever, that he had died, uh, that the young man had died. But oftentimes, yeah, we, we're, we'll certainly take care of crisis issues. When it comes to other, other longer-term stuff, this 
because we're not mandatory, we do have uh, you know a number of other civilian uh, opportunities that, uh, that are out there as well that we can kind of help direct them to. Okay. Any other questions? Once, yes, sir. I guess with um, Pastor Williams, uh, I guess he's been accepted uh, into the chaplaincy of the whole. Right. There's, he's in another hurry up and wait situation. Yeah. yeah. But, but I guess for us as a congregation, um, you know, my question, what I just want to bring up is what can we do to support him and his family as a reverse chaplain? I think he's away. Right. Okay. Um, it's, he and I had quite a few personal conversations about it, and, and uh, one of the things about the things he's not supposed Just what words do you have to us as a congregation to support him? I personally look at it as we're supporting him as a missionary right. in, this, in, this, in this job. And um, you know, maybe like when he's gone, he's just off on sabbatical or something. But what, what can we do, or what should we do, or what should we look for? Up Thank you. Yeah, so he, he will, I think that's a very good way to look at it, you know, he's kind of being a part-time missionary, you know, and doing that. My understanding is, I think he assumed, maybe, and many of us did, that uh, he's going to be assigned to Wright Patterson, and that uh, may not be. So, and that's Maxwell. okay. Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell, okay, you guys know Maxwell. Okay, so he's going down to Alabama. I wasn't sure if he knew that or not. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as a matter of fact, he and I had a conversation. I was out of Tinker Air Force Base traveling, and... Uh, and he and I talked about that, and I said, you know, uh, there's, there's pros and cons both ways. I said, when you go to Max, especially this is your first time, right? I said, I, I, I was kind of concerned with thinking, okay, if, if you get assigned to Max right away, are you going to be doing your duty there, you know, by the way, kind of attend church council meeting, you know, and then get called for an emergency, and, and kind, of, kind of trying to work both, both worlds. I said, I think it's actually good for you to go to Maxwell, at least your first assignment, you know, learn, learn how to be chaplain, and... and Maxwell's predominantly a student population, okay, so if you want to talk about, you know, students, whether they're uh, younger or <laughs> some of our older officers, uh, they go down there for school as well. So I would look at it that way, um, and, and understand, too, that, you know, one of the benefits, he's going to be getting some extra training that, yeah. that many of us don't get in the seminary, so whether it be in counseling and crisis care and stuff like that. He'll have some skills uh, that, that he, you know, will learn along the way that they will apply here, certainly, uh, as well. But, but to just be able to support him and know that, hey, when he's off doing that, um, he's doing the ministry, right? It is kind of a sabbatical because it's a different pace that you're doing something different. It's a little uh, different change of pace. But my guess is they're going to have him preach on Sunday down there and get to step in the pulpit and proclaim the law and gospel, right, to, to whoever happens to be in the chapel that day. Um, being supportive of his family, you know, is, is a great help. And I'm not sure how often uh, Keith Woody and, and his family are used to being apart. I mentioned my wife and I, we're apart a lot. I think we can move. They have me again soon. But uh, <clears throat> but with all that, you know, some folks just, they, when, when, when someone's deployed or when they're gone away or if they're gone for a few weeks or a few months at a time, you know, if something will happen like that, then, then know that, that hey, they got somebody they can reach out to and make sure they're, they're taken care of uh, back, here, back here. So, okay. Um, and you can get a hold of our, uh, our the endorser as well, so Chaplain Mueller and Chaplain McConnell. Uh, we have a, the Missouri Senate actually has a wonderful program called Operation Barnabas, and, and that is started out by really reaching out and helping with congregations uh, that have reserved guard members all the time to, you know, have to step out of the way and do something. And, and so that would be another resource we can talk about today. So I'll back here. Any regrets? Any regrets? No, I would do it all again in a heartbeat. I think my wife would too. She's, she's thankful for it. So. All right, hey, I, we've got the church here in just a few minutes. I don't think it's long. But, uh, let's close in the word of prayer. So God, we thank you for the feet. We bring good news. We thank you for those chaplains who are out, uh, even this morning, around the world. Uh, some of them in harm's way, who have the opportunity to proclaim uh, a good and loving God who sent his son to die for them. We pray that you would be with them, with those that they serve. Uh, and also with uh, Pastor Whitty, soon to be Chaplain Whitty, as he enters this new opportunity for ministry. And we thank you for the congregation here that supports him, and uh, as he would bless their ministry here as well. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen.